Good morning. Welcome to Worship at First United Methodist Church in Newport. Uh, I bring you greetings on an exciting Sunday for I have the pleasure of announcing to you that Reggie and Linda Finnegan are transferring their membership to be part of our fellowship here at First United Methodist. They've been an integral part of our family for a long time, but they have uh, made the choice and uh, made it official to transfer their membership here to be part of this worshiping community. We're very thankful for Reggie and Linda for what they do in our community, but they also covet our prayers as Linda continues to battle her cancer. And uh, the week ahead will be a very important week for them. So please keep Linda very much in your prayers in this coming week, as well as Reggie, as he seeks to do all he can to help her and guide her along the way. As we worship this morning, I I bring you greetings and know that it is uh, the opportunity we always have to worship together as we continue to seek God's will for us, for this world, as we seek to live in justice together. So come this day, bring all that you have and all that you are, and worship. God, our nation is hurting, and our people are losing heart. So we pray for healing, for humility, and for hope. May the values that unite us overcome the things that divide us. May the voices for peace be louder than the voices of violence. May beauty and kindness outshine disorder and hate. And may justice roll and destruction cease. Remind us where we came from. Show us who we are. Inspire us with what we could be together. Hear our prayer and heal our land. Amen. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord, we need you. We need your presence. We need your guidance. We need your comfort. We need your peace. We need your healing. We need your love. We need your justice. Come, gracious Lord, and fill us, we pray. We know we need you, Lord, because we can't do it by ourselves. We, we try and we try and we try, and yet we are constantly overcome by the sin that is always present in our lives. But we know that you are present with us too, that it is your grace that comes to us and gives us life, life anew. Come and fill us, forgive us, and free us that we might walk on humbly with you. We thank you for the gift you have given us in Jesus, for your presence always among us in the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hear our prayer. Come and live in us that we might live for you together now and forevermore. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our scripture lessons this morning begin in the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear the word of God. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And from the ancient book of Exodus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15 from the Common English Bible. One day, after Moses had become an adult... He went out among his people, and he saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. He looked around to make sure no one else was there. Then he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When Moses went out the next day, he saw two Hebrew men fighting with each other. Moses said to the one who had started the fight, Why are you abusing your fellow Hebrew? He replied, Who made you a boss or judge over us? Are you planning to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid when he realized they obviously know what I did. When Pharaoh heard about it, he tried to kill Moses. And from Jeremiah chapter 7, Verses 1 through 11 from the New International Version of the Bible. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Oh, it's the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, And if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, make me, your servant David, disappear, so that your word might be revealed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Social justice is redundant. It's redundant because all justice is social. Justice is a, it's a social concept. It necessarily refers to others. How we live with them, how we treat them, how we are treated, and so on. It's about giving everyone their due. Justice needs to be thought of as a verb. Just as in Micah 6, 8. Justice is something we do with and for others. The just society, therefore, is the one that frees people to do good things. To do good. In other words, a just society allows all of its members to cultivate the virtue of justice. Because you see, individual ethics are much affected by the ethos of the community in which one lives. Uh, in As Kingfisher's Catch Fire by poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, he, he says, the just man justices. The just man justices. At first glance, all these definitions uh, seem circular, saying, in essence, that the just person is just. But it echoes the wisdom of one of the great 20th century philosophers, not Forrest Gump, but his mother, who said, stupid is as stupid does. Justice is, in this sense, its own measure. We know justice when we see it. Hopefully, when we do it. Justice is the mean, that, that area between selfishness and selflessness. That mean has implications within political and economic, social and racial realms. Just as it has implications for the inner life of the soul. Justice orders a person within him or herself as well as the lives of other people. Justice was important to God. What does God require of us? Asks the prophet Micah simply to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. These three simple phrases give shape to the sort of life that God intends for us, that God desires of us, that God would lead us in living. These three phrases, they make a unified whole, but they also stand on their own built on very important biblical concepts like justice, which in the Hebrew is mispat. Unfortunately, in English, I don't, I don't think we talk a lot about justice being a verb of doing justice. But the verb to do captures the biblical meaning of that word, mispat. In Scripture, justice is something truly we do. It is an action. It's never merely sitting back and taking note of the inequities or the wrongs present in society. It, it's doing something about them. When we see a person being wronged by another, it's never enough to simply identify the wrong. We are to instead be part of the solution to live justly, to do justice and correct the wrong. Further, it, it's very evident throughout all of Scripture 
that justice is particularly about looking out for the poor, the immigrant, the widow, the orphan, those who simply cannot do for themselves. Scripture is also very, very succinct that the rich and powerful can do pretty well for themselves. The poor cannot. The importance to God of our doing justice is seen throughout the Bible. It's not just in Jesus. It's not just in the letters of Paul. It's throughout the entire Bible. As we saw in the dramatic stories of the two men we read about this morning, Moses and Jeremiah. You know the story of Moses. You've seen the movie. Hopefully you've read Exodus. Moses gets in trouble because he kills an an Egyptian in response to injustice. Moses has to flee for his life. He pays by having to leave his life and live in exile from that point on. But God heard the cry of his people. God heard his people who were living in an unjust way. And God sent Moses back to proclaim justice. Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet in the midst of the Babylonian exile. And the people were lamenting that they had been exiled from their precious Jerusalem, from the promised land of God. And they continued to point fingers at everyone else. And they lamented that that everyone else had done wrong to the people of God. And, and yet they assimilated with the Babylonian people. They assimilated it by worshiping the, the god Baal. Until God, through his prophet, said, no, (laughs) you're suffering because of your own sins. To live in a just world is to understand that you are the reason you suffer. When you repent of your sin and seek to live justly with each other and with God, you begin to see the blessings that God intends. But what about today? Today, it, it seems as if our, our, our nation and our world has gone backwards a couple of decades. It's not lost on me that this coming week is the time in which we celebrate the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., a man who stood against injustice in our country, in our own region. And so therefore, I think it important to share his words as we close out this week. Hear these words that he wrote from a jail in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. He'd been accused of of being untimely and unwise with his tactics. He'd been accused of being an extremist. Hear his response. And now this approach of civil civil disobedience is being termed extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremist will we be? 
Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s words ring loudly today. We must proclaim, as he did, that God calls us to be just in our lives as brothers and sisters who seek first God's kingdom, not our own. Not that of anyone else, but God. All that we do and all that we say with all that we have and all that we are must be dedicated to serving God. Anything else we do is sin. God help us all. God forgive us all. That we might do justice in this day and forevermore. The good news, he gave us himself in Christ Jesus. He's with us even still through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we can walk on and know that he forgives us. But he also empowers us, emboldens us, and equips us that we can do his justice in the world. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And amen.
go into the world and live justly. Do God's justice now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. And may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen. And amen.